So uh, I think, um, John, can you unmute the people as we call them for roll or do they, does everybody need to unmute? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, they can, un they can unmute themselves. It's just set to mute as they join the meeting. Okay, then I'm gonna ask uh, Dana to go ahead and unmute herself and, and take roll for the meeting. Just note that um, everyone, if you click on your picture, you can click on unmute to speak and you and uh, just reply with here. Hey, Dana Rooney, committee assistant. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I will read the role for members and for staff. Chairman Sean Tarwater. Here. Vice Chairman Ken Corbett. Ranking Minority Stan Fraunfelter. Here. Representative Tom Burroughs. Here. Representative Will Carpenter. Here. Representative Chris Croft. Here. Representative Pam Curtis. Here. Representative Ron Highland. Here. Representative Don Heineman. Here. All right, he made it good. Representative Kyle Hoffman. Here. Representative Jan Kessinger. Here. Representative Marty Long. Here. Representative Les Mason. Here. Representative Jason Probst. Here. Representative Bradley Ralph. Here. Representative Louis Ruiz. Here. Representative Randy Williams. Here. Researcher Eddie Pinner. Here. Researcher John Hess. Here. Researcher Chris Courtright. Chris is here. He is our, des our office's designated YouTube video monitor. So he uh, is here. Thank you. Assistant Revisor Chuck Reimer. Here. Assistant Revisor Zach Friedel. Here. And myself. And that <coughs> Role. Okay, thank you. I'm reaching out to uh, Representative Corbett. I know he wanted to be on the call or on the on the meeting, so um, he may still be trying to figure it out. So I resent him the link. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. First of all, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I know you're probably all zoomed out by now, but um, the speaker had asked us to take a look at some of these unemployment issues that are going on. We needed to get an update um, so because the Department of Labor has made uh, uh, quite a bit of an effort to revamp the system to accommodate for some of these new federal programs that uh, we're trying to help people with. And um, the more that you're familiar with how these things work, the better you'll be able to help your constituents. Um, then we also want to take a look at some of the uh, executive orders or at least executive order, uh, I think it was 17 that we need to take a look at um, as far as some of the requirements and waiving, uh, and waiving some of the requirements anyway. So that's what we're going to start with today and, and I would uh, welcome Madam Secretary Garcia to go ahead and uh, start with that presentation. Thank you Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks for joining okay. me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair Tarwater um, and Ranking Brownfelter and members of the committee. Uh, it is great to see some familiar faces when I served in the legislature 10 years ago and others. I've, I know we've done other Zoom calls. Um, I also want to note that I have on the line with me uh, some of my staff, my Deputy Secretary, Brett Flashbarth, um, who formerly uh, was our unemployment director, and then our current new unemployment insurance director, Laurel Searles and our Deputy Chief Counsel, Eunice Peters. 
Um, before I get started, I also want to note that um, Julie McGinney, who's also our legislative director, sent you all attachments uh, to sort of supplement everything I'm going to be telling you. So that way you can, you know, use for your constituents, you can copy and paste, you can send it out an email. Uh, but I just wanted to note that as well. And just to give you an overview of what how we're going to be doing this right now is I'm going to just share some very important numbers with you, um, both at the federal and state level. And then we're um, I'm going to pass it over to my uh, a deputy chief counsel to sort of review what Chairman Tarwater was talking about right now about the remaining CARES Act pieces. Um, and then also have our unemployment insurance director review the, all the programs that are, have been passed in these last three bills. And then I'll wrap it up and then we can um, have it for Q&A for you all. But I wanted to start off with numbers. Um, the National Labor, April, April Labor Report uh, that was released just last Thursday revealed the national unemployment rate uh, increase of about 10.3% uh, points, which is now at 14 0.7%. I will repeat that at 14.7%. Now before April, or about before March 15th, it was something at about 3.4%. So we have done a huge uh, jump. This magnitude um, is on par with uh, the Great Depression. However, the speed is immensely faster. Uh, it took about the Great Depression about two and a half years to see the employment declines that we are seeing in just six weeks. Um, Kansas joins all the other states across the country as we grapple to confront basically the, this capacity uh, challenges. And while our state April labor report won't be released until next week on May 22nd, in the, in the interim, um, our unemployment data cements this historically unprecedented health and economic crisis. So I want to share with you between March 15th, when we all started this, until uh, May 9th, um, these are the numbers uh, that, that are currently we received. 236,412 total initial claims. And last week we had about 115,536 continued weekly claims with about 93,888 individuals receiving benefit payments. Now, some of you may ask, do we have enough money to sustain this in our trust fund? The answer is yes. Uh, so I wanna share with you the current most recent amount as of uh, May 9th, uh, it, the amount in the trust fund balance is 957 million. So that those are new numbers as of this morning. Uh, so I wanted to reassure you that. And also thank you for, um, it was because of the partnership with the legislature and uh, the business community and other stakeholders who after the last recession happened, everybody got together and said, we do not want to be in this position to have to borrow money from the federal government and be charged some of that interest. So in order to uh, put ourselves in a better position, we um, did, took proper uh, necessary steps and that's why we have a good trust fund balance. So I just wanted to say hats off to the legislature for that. Um, so far, payments have totaled roughly about 325 million, including the federal pandemic unemployment compensation, which is also referred to as FPUC. And that is the $600 payment. I want to thank you for supporting the emergency declaration in order for us here at the Kansas Department of Labor to accept those funds for our hardworking Kansans to receive. So I just wanna state that as you can see, this will not be over this month and we will continue to receive um, updated guidance from the US Department of Labor on a weekly basis. So I, I see that you will be hearing from them uh, later on this week. Um, I will say that we will need flexibility con to continue working with the federal government uh, for the rest of this year. Uh, Congress may pass further legislation to address continuing or new needs for employers and employees. Um, so far, we keep hearing rumors that something might happen this summer. Um, so I want all of us to be aware of that. And that we could face significant challenges or roadblocks to receiving further funding if the Kansas legislature is not in session. So I ask for your continued support uh, and continued partnership in the coming weeks and months in order to continue serving our hardworking Kansans uh, who are your constituents to receive these funds. But I wanna say something very important in the bigger picture of all this. Um, when evaluating the status of the unemployment insurance system, it is important to understand the overall structure and the challenges presented. As, as it has been discussed, the primary processing tool of our UI system is called a legacy mainframe system. And you've heard me talk about that a lot uh, over the past few weeks. And while it is reliable, the mainframe systems uh, do have present, have present challenges. 
Specifically, the ability to rapidly respond to numerous changes at once is extremely difficult. And I've said before, um, the frame system that we adopted was about in the late 1970s, and we've done incremental little touches here and there over the past 40 some years. And in the current crisis, our, our Kansas Department of Labor IT staff are tasked with implementing a number of things, five things in particular, and I wanna state what they are. One, the waiting week, um, the removal of the waiting week. Two, an extension of Kansas benefits from 26 weeks to 16 weeks, from 16 weeks that you all passed. Also three, the federally funded increase uh, in benefits of $600 per week, which is the FPUC funds. And then four, the additional 13 weeks of federally funded benefits for certain qualifying claims. And then five, and that's the big one, and that's the one that just happened, went live today. So you guys are the first to hear that update here in a few minutes. And that is the creation of a brand new program, um, which is our uh, PUA program. Uh, it's, a, it, it's the one that prevents, uh, I'm sorry, it, it provides benefits to self-employed and others not traditionally eligible for the unemployment insurance benefits. And so these changes all utilize the same payment file. So all of those five programs, including the big, the big one we just created um, that was going live today, uh, they share the same payment file. So those uh, changes must be in concert with each other. And so that creates a challenge in itself because it, they have to be in concert. It's like a Jenga kind of, uh, the game Jenga, if you pull one, something, something might happen if they're because they're all related. So this requires painstaking uh, code review and testing. And so further, the ability to utilize additional outs, uh, outside resources is limited due, the, to, due to the unfamiliarity with the KDAL mainframe environment. And even current uh, programming staff, inherent challenges uh, are presented due to code documentation issues that have occurred over a period of several years. And on top of the mainframe, KDAL also utilizes, utilizes this, uh, what's called an internet web environment. It's a Siebel case man management functionality. And so these distinct environments uh, are part of previous modernization efforts that have increased the functionality in certain areas. However, they are not a comprehensive technology stack and have uh, not been upgraded or maintained over the past few years. So the result of that is that our unemployment system is extremely vulnerable to the types of massive data that is currently hitting our system due to the ongoing public health and economic crisis. So um, as our technology changes around the mainframe, the code uh, does not, and it is inflexible. So meaning it takes more effort to put changes onto any kind of production, including five all at once. So despite these unprecedented challenges, I am thankful to my, uh, the ingenuity and dedication of my own staff here at the Kansas Department of Labor in combination with uh, you all and the le state legislature and partnership of our governor. The legislature's initial action of extending unemployment benefits um, weeks suspended the waiting week in tandem with the governor's action like the emergency declaration have all been very crucial for our hardworking Kansans and employers. Um, these uh, actions have allowed for my agency to receive vital federal funding and implement essential uh, operations like allowing us to reassign staff from other agencies and divisions to assist with the immense volume of our unemployment insurance. So without these actions, I am confident we would be in a worse uh, position. So now I wanna share with you how we will be, uh, we will need to continue serving our Kansans moving forward and we'll need to maintain compliance with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act um, and extend the Kansas legislature's uh, previous actions on this. And I wanna again, thank you for doing that. We must pass these federally mandated requirements in order to receive vital uh, federal funding for your constituents. So I'm gonna just uh, share on March 18th, 2020, the president signed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which makes emergency supplemental appropriations in response to the spread of the COVID-19 and includes the Emergency Unemployment Insurance Stabilization and Access Act. Um, and then sets out requirements for emergency administrative grants to states and provides um, four things. And so I'll list the four things. One emergency administrative grants to states, two, emergency flexibilities to states relating to temporarily modifying certain aspects of the UC laws, three, a short-term waiver of the Title VII interest payments due to the interest accrual on Title VII advances to states, and four, uh, full federal funding under certain circumstances 
uh, of extended benefits paid through December 31st of this year. So on March 27th, um, President Trump signed into law the coronavirus aid, relief, and economic application requirements to receive allotment one of the emergency administrative grants. So at this point, I'd like to introduce to you our Kansas Department of Labor Deputy Chief Counsel Eunice Peters, who will review for you these important provisions to receive the next allotment that is coming. Uh, Eunice, are you on the line? Okay, her video is not working. So then I will go ahead and review that piece. Um, so basically at a high level, um, the executive order 2017 allowed the state to meet uh, these requirements to receive emergency administrative uh, grants. So those are allotments one and two under the um, for Families First Act piece. Uh, and many of these requirements involved waiving statutory requirements uh, on a temporary basis. So now the um, EO 2028 extended the EO 2017. Thus the state's ability to meet these requirements will end on or, or before May 31st, which is just in three weeks. So if the state does not continue to meet these requirements on or before September 15th, it will not be eligible for the allotment two under this act. So one of these requirements is the wa waiving a week waiver, which also allows the state to receive additional federal reimbursement funding under the CARES Act. I know it says September uh, of this year, but I will note uh, to you all that we keep hearing rumors that there may be another piece of fourth legislation um, happening with federal Congress this summer. Should that happen, we may need until December. Um, so I'm just putting that on your radar because I and understand you all, Sine Die is next week. Um, so this is very important. And this is what Chairman Tarwater was talking about as we have been sharing this information with him in the last uh, few days. So in anticipation uh, for the EO 2017 expiring at the end of this month, KDAL is proposing um, the following. Uh, uh, it could be legislation or just extending um, the, uh, well, one of the options we said is, is extending the um, emergency uh, declaration. And so these are the uh, six sections that I want to just give you a high level piece of, and that was uh, section one, it meets the um, allotment two requirement uh, this is state's commitment to the UC system. Section two, waiving uh, the work search requirement. Um, also, that's a part of the allotment two requirement. Section, um, another part of that meets the um, CARES Act federal reimbursement funding. Um, and I believe we submitted that uh, attachment for you all. And then section three is employer notification to employees, which meets the also the allotment number one required. So some of these are different allotments. And so if, if you all, or if, we, if you're not gonna be in session, it'll be hard to accept these funds to deliver to your constituents. Um, section four, non-charging allowance to contributing and related uh, rated government employers. Um, that we've been hearing a lot of uh, as well from employers. And so this will be important to be able to accept these funds. Also the reimbursing employers piece that specifies the charge of payments uh, will be reimbursed to employers under the CARES Act federal reimbursement funding process. Um, this expands the allowance of reimbursing uh, employers by authorizing the state to provide additional relief to such payments. And then the last section is uh, the Kansas Register Publication, which is requesting earlier uh, enactment into law since the EO 2017 expires at the end of this month. So um, the important part to know is the certain employer contributing employers have also reached out to us for a waiver of the negative account employer the requirement. And this waiver will allow them to participate in the state's shared work and employment insurance program. An employer uh, may use shared work in lieu of temporary layoffs, the total layoffs for of employees, as it allows for partial a work week and partial unemployment benefits, which has been very helpful to a lot of Kansas employers here. Um, and contributing employers, which are the majority of Kansas uh, employers and all private employers, are further required to not have a negative account. So a negative account employer is one whose a total benefits charged to the employer's account exceeds all contributions paid um, of, by the employer for all years. So under section 2108 of the CARES Act, payments under Kansas' shared uh, work UI program will be reimbursed with, by the federal government for weeks of unemployment beginning on or after March 27th of this year until the end of this year, December 31st. 
So we are, pr are proposing the following uh, piece of legislation to be considered to allow uh, these employers to participate um, in the section five piece, which is the shared work program uh, in response to this constituents request, but the state will also have uh, receive federal reimbursement funding under the CARES Act for payments under this uh, program. And again, um, all of this is in the attachment. I will be passing this now to our uh, unemployment insurance director, Laurel Skirles, who can share um, any addition to what I just missed and also the, all the programs included in the CARES Act. Laurel? Thank you, Madam Secretary, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and esteemed members of the committee. I'm going to be providing a brief overview and update of the status of the new federal programs in Kansas. There are There is more detailed information in the testimony submitted by Secretary Garcia. I'm just going to try to give you a high-level overview today. Um, I, I know I have talked to you and Secretary Garcia has talked to you about some of these programs. Um, and they are included in the first UI bill. Passing the bill will allow us to continue with what we have been doing in addition to retaining the vital federal funding that Secretary Garcia just discussed. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that we be able to uh, receive these federal funds to be able to um, serve the, the Kansas citizens. So as Secretary Garcia said, the CARES Act was signed into law um, March 27th, 2020. The law includes a number of provisions on various topics related to unemployment insurance, notably pandemic unemployment assistance, emergency unemployment relief for governmental entities and nonprofit organizations, federal pandemic unemployment compensation, temporary full funding of the first week of compensable regular unemployment, emergency state staffing flexibility, pandemic emergency unemployment, temporary financing of short-time compensation payments in states with uh, such programs and grants for the short-time compensation programs. To start with PUA, this is a program that provides an employment benefit to those not traditionally eligible for unemployment insurance compensation, such as contract laborers, self-employed and gig workers. The application for this program launched today as Secretary Garcia reported as of 1.40 p.m. today, um, just a little over 20 minutes ago, we had already received uh, 6,773 applications and 12,939 weekly claims for that program. That's since about 7 a.m. this morning that we've seen those numbers. Um, Governor Kelly did sign the agreement for Kansas to participate in PUA on March 28th, 2020, and Secretary Garcia delivered that agreement to USDOL on the same day. At CADOL, we have been working with our UI team, our IT team, and our legal team to interpret the CARES Act and federal guidance from the United States Department of Labor to implement the new program. We are utilizing a phased approach. Phase one is the piece that was completed today. That is the completely brand new system to accept applications uh, for, for this program. Phase two is going to allow our developers to process those applications and begin issuing payments. And so we anticipate payments going out to those individuals no later than May 25th of 2020. Phase three will involve issuing payments to claimants that are eligible for um, partial unemployment insurance payments and or claimants that have exhausted unemployment insurance benefits. And that will be completed no later than June 16th, 2020. So in addition to providing benefits to those that are self-employed, it also provides a benefit to those who have exhausted regular UI and the federal extension for UI. And so that piece will be going, is, is the final step that will be going into place in June. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk about the emergency increase in unemployment compensation benefits. This is the FPUC payment that Secretary Garcia spoke about. Uh, that's the additional $600 is added every week to eligible claimants unemployment insurance benefit. So if a claimant is able to receive just $1 in unemployment insurance benefits, they have the additional $600 F paid out to them on top of this. This um, benefit is paid for the weeks after the agreement was entered into, which was March 28th, 2020, and will end no later than July 31st, 2020. Governor Kelly did sign that agreement and Secretary Garcia submitted it on the same day. We began paying out FPUC payments on April 22nd, 2020, and we began paying the back weeks of the FPUC payments on May 6th, 2020. Those are being staggered um, throughout 
the, the following days. So as people file their weekly claims, their retroactive payments will be paid to them at that time. Last night, we did exceed the cap that we are allowed to pay out in um, unemployment insurance, or we're allowed to pay out. And so the payments for last week, not all of those FPUC payments, the retro payments went out last night. They will continue to, to go out throughout the week. Um, we anticipate reaching the cap again tonight, and then um, hopefully we'll be able to get all those payments out this week. The next program I wanna talk about is the temporary full funding for the first week of compensable regular unemployment insurance, unemployment for states with no waiting week. This provides 100% funding for states who have waived the traditional waiting week. The 100% funding includes actual costs as well as our administrative costs. Governor Kelly also signed that agreement and Secretary Garcia uh, delivered it to USDOL on March 28th. We are working towards compliance with these requirements. On March 31st, 2020, Governor Kelly issued Executive Order 20-17 to waive the waiting week requirement for claims related to COVID-19. The mainframe programmers and our IT team worked to write and deploy the code that would waive the waiting week. Um, they first attempt deployment on March 26, 2020. However, that attempt was not completely successful. They've made numerous attempts to fix that to ensure that the waiting week is paying out for all claimants. However, there are still, we know that there are still issues and that approximately uh, 1,500 claimants have not received their waiting week payment at this time. Our mainframe team continues to explore what that underlying issue is that's preventing those payments from uh, going out. At the same time, our fiscal team is working uh, with USDL for reimbursement of those costs. Uh, emergency state staffing flexibility lifts the usual merit staffing requirement that apply to the unemployment insurance programs. That uh, flexibility goes through December 31st, 2020. It was put into place to facilitate quick hiring and rehiring of staff. When we started the week of March 15th, 2020, we had just over 20 people working as intake representatives answering the phones for KDOL in our UI division. Uh, that is because we are, our funding is tied to the federal, the federal, or it's federal funding and it's tied to the unemployment insurance rate. And as our unemployment insurance rate had been historically low for many years, our staffing was also historically low. So overnight that changed. Um, during the week of March 22nd, we acted quickly to double our staff. We did that in intake by bringing back staff that we had promoted to other parts of the agency and brought them back to answer the phones. During the week of March 29th, we brought in additional staff from other sections of the unemployment insurance division. We trained them on what it takes to be an intake agent and we set them to work answering the phones. At that point, we had a, approximately 60 intake representatives. Uh, shortly thereafter, we established a triage contact center with the assistance of the governor's office, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Commerce. The triage contact center answers basic unemployment questions, which leaves our CADOL intake staff for the more difficult questions that require access to our complicated uh, mainframe and Siebel system. With the addition of the triage contact center staff, our number of intake representatives grew to well over 100. However, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Commerce are going to have their employees returning to their normal job duties on May 18th of 2020. We're gonna begin moving away from that triage contact center model and focus on our long-term staffing solutions. It's imperative that we increase the number of skilled intake staff that we have on hand to meet the needs of the claimants and employers across the state of Kansas. We are working uh, in, in order to hire uh, consecutive small intake classes that can be trained while still social distancing. On May 11th, 2020, our first class of five began taking calls full time and our second class of seven began training. We're currently interviewing for our next intake class. Uh, these trainings do need to be done in person because of the um, difficulty of, of learning our system. And we have to ensure the health and safety of our own employees uh, and allow for social distancing. So we are limited in the number of individuals that we can have in any one training class. Throughout the pandemic, we've also been heavily recruiting former employees and rearranging our staff within KDOL to best respond to this crisis. 
I currently have 109 employees that fall into these categories. Either they're former staff members that have come back or they are staff members who work traditionally in our um, industrial safety and health or workers' compensation division that have come over to the unemployment insurance division to assist us at this time. The next program I'm going to brief you on is the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Program, PEUC. This provides additional unemployment compensation benefits for those who exhaust regular unemployment under state law. Uh, this is an additional 13 weeks of benefits that is federally funded. Governor Kelly did sign that agreement and Secretary Garcia delivered it to USDOL on March 28, 2020. Uh, USDOL released the guidance through UPOL 1720 on April 10th. My staff completed the business requirements on April 13th, 2020. However, our IT team have not been able to begin taking action on this project until this week. This is another program that requires extensive mainframe programming and utilizes that same payment file that all these prior programs have been utilizing. And so they have been focused on extending benefits out to 26 weeks, waiving the waiting week, making sure that we can get PUA payments paid out and getting the additional $600 in benefits paid out. We have had to um, prioritize these different programs as we have moved on. And so we are now working on the PEUC program within our um, mainframe team. Next, the temporary financing of short-time compensation uh, payments in states with STC programs. That provides us 100% reimbursement for benefits paid under our STC program, which you may be familiar as our shared work program. Reimbursement may be made for up to 26 weeks uh, or 26 times the weekly benefit amount. Uh, we do call this our shared work program in Kansas. We have seen an increase in usage of this program as it's been very beneficial to employers and employees across the state. An employer or business owner may use the shared work in lieu of temporary total layoffs. It allows for a partial work week and a partial unemployment insurance benefit. Uh, it is not available for seasonal layoffs. Governor Kelly again signed this agreement on March 28th and it was delivered to USDOL on March 28th. We are going to seek reimbursement for these weeks through December 31st, 2020, which is the maximum time period for which reimbursement may be sought under the federal law. There are also grants for these programs um, that are put into place to promote, promote and assist enrolling employers in the programs. There's $100 million in grant funds available for that for all the states. Uh, we are going to seek some of those program, or some of those federal dollars to be able to further promote our, our program. Uh, guidance from USDOL is just now beginning to come out on the STC programs. Uh, we did receive some, I can't remember if it was the UPOL that came out last night or, or the day before, um, but we are getting guidance from USDOL, not, not just weekly, but, but daily, sometimes multiple times a day. So that's a brief overview of um, the federal programs and where we are at. Now I'm going to turn it back over to, to Secretary Garcia. Okay, I mute myself. Thank you, Laurel. Um, and I believe Eunice is able to call in instead of face. Uh, Eunice, are you there? I am, Secretary. Okay. Um, would, apologize. Would like anything? Um, no, I'm ready to stand for questions if there are any. Thank you for your patience. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, just wrap up. Uh, that is all of our briefing on the unemployment piece of it. Uh, and I do want to wrap up with sharing a, another piece that is related to the COVID-19 part that we at the Kansas Department have been working on aside in addition to the unemployment stuff. And that is um, we've been working on, uh, we submitted a regulation regarding um, uh, protections for our first responders and healthcare workers um, as they risk their lives battling the COVID-19 on the front lines for providing life-saving care for our Kansans, uh, even though they may not have healthcare or resources of their own. Uh, we would join other states like our neighboring state of Missouri to ensure the safety of our frontline workers so they can know while they are risking their lives uh, to take care of our fellow Kansans that we will be taking care of them. But this re regulation was denied um, on the basis that it needs uh, legislative action. And so we would ask for your support on this as well, should there be an opportunity to conduct a hearing, uh, although I know you may or may or not uh, have hearings this week or next week, but just in case there uh, was an opportunity, we would like to ask for that. 
um, and, and important, you know, exploring all options for our Kansas uh, workers and welcome your partnership um, in this essential endeavor. So in closing, um, I know uh, Julie has been in touch with many of you, uh, if not on a weekly, much sometimes a daily basis and sharing our information that's ever changing, that's gonna continue through the summer and the fall. Um, so we will be here uh, for you and all of our Kansans. And I wanna thank you um, all for your hard work uh, and this opportunity to update your committee on the unemployment services and our activity here at the Kansas Department of Labor. Um, as we adjust to our new normal, I am looking forward to continuing our partnership to build a better Kansas uh, and move our state forward. And at this moment, uh, I'm happy to stand for any questions along with my staff uh, that you may have, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you so much, Madam Secretary, for taking the time to go through all this and your staff. Um, there are a few questions here. I see that Representative Carpenter and Burroughs both have questions in that order. And I will, um, I'll call on them here in a minute. I wanted to touch on a, a few things. Um, first and foremost, the, the last thing you mentioned was the uh, presumed, uh, uh, the presumption that you get COVID-19 while at work if you are working as a healthcare worker and you wanted to try to put a bill in for that because you cannot do it by regulation. Um, so the bill that I had seen or the, the last time I spoke to you, it wasn't limited just to healthcare workers. It was, it was also uh, several other businesses such as anyone in the uh, process in the line of planting, cultivating, shipping, delivering, uh, and serving yeah, essential. Food, and serving essential food. all the essential workers currently. Uh, would also be presumed to have uh, contracted the disease at work. And um, I had asked you at that time, um, I had a concern of what it would cost the insurance carriers and what it would cost the, the, uh, um, the private self-insured individuals that have you know, adequate reserves for their current risk. When we add this risk to, to um, we add this additional risk to the pool, how are they gonna pay the claims? And because I would imagine that some of these claims could be pretty large and they are no one, no insurance company and no self-insured could possibly have proper amounts of reserves. And so if we were to enact this, what, you know, at that time you hadn't spoken to any insurance companies or at least not heard back. And so um, I've, I've spoken to a few and, uh, you know, they refer to it as the California law because California did the same thing. And so with that, the insurance companies are kind of all running scared. They're not sure what their liability is and how much additional premium they're gonna to have to charge these businesses. And so have you heard back from any of the uh, insurance companies that you reach out to and, and what this would do to that industry? Yes, uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for that question. Um, actually, after we um, hung up with you, I did check with my work comp director and he did um, share that he actually had spoken to the insurance um, company, some of them in, in the Kansas City area. Um, and I, I did not know that before talking to you. Um, and the, that, that was something, a conversation that we'd like to have during a hearing to see what's, what would be some of those options, whether it be something like maybe like a trust fund kind of piece, or should there be a, a fourth piece of federal legislation that does support that for, uh, in support of employers? Um, but that's why we were proposing, should there be an opportunity to have some kind of uh, committee hearing this week or next week, that we would like to have that opportunity. So what did the insurance companies tell you about the additional risk? Um, well, I believe they, and I can't recall, um, Brett, I'm not sure if you're, my deputy's on the line um, of what our um, work comp uh, director told us. I just know that there was a conversation um, and that they would uh, be, you know, willing to talk to the legislators to see what that would look like. There was, I don't believe there was like an amount yet. Okay, great. Um, I look forward to, to seeing, I've, I reached out to a, a few insurance companies here and they had not heard from you yet, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll, we'll cross that bridge, I guess, when we get to it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, as, as I mentioned, uh, it's too late to try to introduce the bill into commerce. So you would have to try to figure out a way to get that into a, an exec, you know, a, an exempt committee. Let's go ahead and move on to some of the questions that we have but from the committee. 
and uh, Representative Carpenter, we'll start, we'll start with you and please unmute yourself and then remute yourself when you're done asking. Thank you. Representative Will Carpenter here. Madam Secretary, um, you talked about the self-employment piece, uh, taking applications now. Yes. Last week in talking with uh, Julie, um, it was three to six weeks before any checks were gonna be issued. Has that changed? Is that still the uh, timeline? Um, Laurel, you wanna help answer that piece? Yes, uh, thank you, Representative Carpenter. The date that we have anticipated to issue payments is on May 25th of 2020. Uh, they have assured me that payments will be going out no later than May 25th. Uh, I'm always hopeful that they'll go out earlier, but I'm at the mercy of, of my mainframe programmers. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, Representative Carpenter, I, I would like to add um, and just another uh, plug-in of the importance that Kansas must modernize. Uh, we were in the process of doing that um, last summer. We started into the fall and we were about to go for an RFP um, this, this in February, and then coronavirus happened. Um, so I can't stress enough the importance of, of modernizing Kansas and modernization, and particularly in this program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, thanks, Madam Secretary. And um, since you mentioned that, I was wondering if maybe uh, you could look back in, I know you're, you're, you're the new secretary, but if you could look back in some of your notes from uh, the Sebelius administration in 2004, we off we the the legislator off you know authorized 21 million dollars in bonds to finance a new program for exactly the Kansas uninsurance benefits computer system, mm -hmm. and um, then in 2007 another 26 million dollars uh, was issued from the federal government as well, and it looks like about 70 some million dollars was spent uh, researching uh, having a new site and employing a new site. That seems like an awful lot of money. Now, I mean, I, granted um, it was the same person that spent hundreds of millions of dollars on a website that didn't work for healthcare. But if we could look back there, maybe there's a lot that we had, had learned with the millions and millions of dollars of research that we did without ever changing anything. And so maybe that would be a good place to start. And I would imagine that we would be much, much, it would be much less expensive to fix this at this point with technology changing like it has. What, yes. what are you anticipate having to spend to redo this again? Um, so modernizing this system uh, and looking at what it would cost is would be at the low end at about 35 million uh, up to about maybe 48 uh, to 50 million. Um, and that's going off of models that have been uh, successful in this, like Mississippi, like um, Idaho, and actually our next door neighbor, Missouri, um, like copied the state of uh, Mississippi's uh, model. They have modernized next door. So it's been a bit frustrating when we have people in the Kansas City area saying, my neighbor across the street is getting their $600 faster. Or, you know, we share the frustration, um, but a, m a more modernized system was able to get stuff out faster. Um, so, and, and, you know, like you mentioned, it's been over 40 some years um, that plenty of everybody has uh, ownership to this and it's, we're interested in moving forward and how do we, you know, position Kansas to be ready for the next um, pandemic or hopefully not pandemic, but next state emergency. Okay, uh, Representative Burroughs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for your, all your work under these most trying and challenging times to you and staff for getting out as much communication as possible in such a timely manner and all your assistance from a number of us that have reached out to you with concerns for our constituents. Uh, I do have one question. It has yeah. come to my attention about the tax implications, not only on the unemployment insurance that the state will be paying, but also the tax implications on the feds. Do we know where we may be in reference to how that will affect uh, those receiving UI benefits? Um, I'm gonna have my um, deputy secretary or UI director speak to that. And you're asking about this, the tax 
for employers at the state level? No, Madam Secretary, I'm at, uh, asking about the uh, income tax implications that uh, the uh, those receiving un UI benefits will have at the end of the year once the pandemic is um, has passed, hopefully uh, been addressed at that time. But I do believe that the 600 from the government on a weekly basis, as well as what we're paying in UI benefits, do have tax complications. So I'm looking for some guidance. Yes, yes. Um, the $600 is taxed uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, Laurel, if you could share more information on that. Absolutely. So the unemployment insurance benefits and the additional federal funding are both considered taxable income that will have to be reported on your income taxes. Every year we issue tax documentation to uh, all the claimants who have received unemployment insurance benefits throughout the year in order uh, for them to be able to complete their income tax filings. So there are tax implications. Claimants do have the opportunity to withhold taxes um, from uh, both their FPUC benefit and from their state uh, regular unemployment insurance benefits. So they are able to have tax withheld from their benefits. Okay, um, is, that, is that a good, Representative Barrows, you have anything else? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I do appreciate the clarity. I know that has been asked not only of myself, but others, but I thought this would be a good forum in which to get that information out. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, Representative Corbett. You have to uh, unmute yourself there, Ken. Hang on. You got it. Oh, you had it. Now? Oh, you got it, yeah. And so let, okay. let the record show so, that uh, Representative Corbett is with us. He wasn't available for the roll call, but he's got it figured out now. So the question I have is for all the employers out there who are having their work comp um, savings depleted, not by their choice, uh, by, but by the way the things are happening, by the time they get the renewal notices for their um, uh, policies next time, next year, I'm afraid that their premiums may be so um, double, triple, or quadruple to none of their to none of their, none of their fault. And um, if we don't do anything, I think that there's going to be some serious shockwaves uh, to the to the employers in this state. Yes, Representative, I think you're re referring to the unemployment insurance premium, not the workers' compensation premium. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think we discussed that on an earlier call, um, and the un the uninsurance premium adjustment comes out, I believe, in November every year for the following year, and so that would be something that we would want to try to uh, get a, get in front of because they will they will certainly go up with with our current unemployment figures, and I think the secretary has a staff member that can explain to us exactly how that works. Yeah. And maybe we can get ahead of it with a with some sort of an executive order to freeze it, uh, freeze the increase or any increase at all until after the first quarter of next year, so that we can uh, look at it closely in commerce next year and come up with a with a good way to to adjust those numbers. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you speak to that? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm going to have my Deputy Secretary uh, chime in. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so as we discussed yesterday, the tax rates for 2020 are locked in uh, absent some additional uh, action by the legislature. Um, embedded in the employment security law through legislation that was done in 2015, Senate Bill 154, are solvency triggers. And what those do is they, they look at something called the average high cost multiple, which is the most commonly used actuarial evaluating trust fund solvency. And if the trust fund uh, amount under this average high cost multiple hits certain levels, taxes can go up or down. So currently in this year and for last year, employers are enjoying a half percent tax reduction because the trust fund was in excellent uh, shape and we passed a solvency trigger to where taxes were reduced. Um, Conversely, under the same legislation, as the tax fund, or excuse me, the trust fund balance drops, there's some uh, solvency triggers that would increase taxes uh, depending on the balance. Um, 
we've been pretty consistent in terms of projecting trust fund that we just don't have the data yet. Um, the analogy I've used is much like the public health figures, a model is only good as the data you have in it. And we're still so early in this. We know the burn rate, so to speak, for what's coming out the trust fund is extraordinary. But I think we need a few months more of data to determine how that's carrying over, as well as maybe getting some picture of the depth of the current economic crisis. But I think it's safe to say that the amount of money coming out the trust fund now, we would not only uh, lose the solvency trigger that gives the tax cut for next year, but we would start to get closer and closer to uh, the solvency triggers that add taxes additionally kicking in. Um, we went into this recession in about as good a shape as you could be from a trust fund perspective. We were one of about half the states that were considered solvent. We had just under a billion dollars. Um, conversely, going into the Great Recession, we had about $660 million, and we were borrowing from the federal government in about uh, 18 months. Um, we are a state that is in good position and, and, and our ability to maintain uh, trust fund balances is going to be somewhat uncertain. I would have to think you're going to need to see some sort of uh, aggressive intervention at the federal level. Um, as we discussed yesterday, in Kansas, the evaluation is going to be months. I, I can see that there are currently some states where they're, they're looking at weeks in terms of having trust fund issues, where the federal government's going to have to move beyond just loaning money, uh, but also looking to uh, uh, buttress those those trust fund balances. So at minimum, we're looking at um, some losses and tax cuts this year, and likely some tax increases if we if we have the status quo. And bear in mind, if we do if we do give tax relief, we still have to figure out how we're going to keep that money in the trust fund and meet the requirements from the federal government to borrow um, uh, to keep that those those uh, benefits available for claimants. Yeah, so as some of these other states fail early, we might have a better uh, idea of what the, how the federal government is going to react later when we when we need their help. So, uh, and I think we can all agree that we want to that businesses need uh, you know tax decreases or costs to be lower rather than than higher in order to survive, especially since we're so slow to kind of uh, get people back to work. And so hopefully we'll get there. Representative uh, Corbett, did you have a follow up to that? That's, <clears throat> that's kind of a good look at, a, a, you know, a 30,000 feet. But each business and each company, they all have different ratios and, and um, factors that raise their invent, um, their cost. And uh, like some of your non-essential businesses who are not allowed to be open, they're going to be depleted far earlier than some that never got affected mm -hmm. too much at all. But it needs it needs a good look at and. I hope the governor or someone kind of puts a stop to kind of protect the small business guys a little bit. Uh, yes, um, thank you, uh, Representative Corbett. Mr. Chair, I'd like to add, uh, so we keep hearing that there might be a fourth uh, federal bill coming that actually uh, may include some of this. We don't know, have any other details or information on that, um, but we are, like I said, we're staying in contact with U.S. Department of Labor uh, seems on a weekly basis. Sometimes it seems like on a daily basis. So when we do hear that, we will share that information with you. Um, but again, that goes back to, as, as I shared in the beginning, uh, we know this is not gonna be over this month. Uh, and we uh, thank you for your support in the uh, you know emergency declaration that we're gonna need that flexibility um, this summer and the fall as well. Okay, and wh while we're on that subject, Brett, would you be able to shed some light on the negative balances issue that is it the shared work program that needs the needs a positive balance in order for that to work or? Yeah, so basically um, in, in terms of contributing employers, which is the vast majority of private businesses in the state of Kansas, you'll have, uh, it's an experience rated system. So basically your tax rate is gonna be dictated by how frequently uh, former employees are using the system. Employers that uh, have, uh, em former employees who draw more benefits than the employer has paid in in taxes, uh, are typically going to be referred to as negative balance employers. And with that, they have a higher tax rate versus an employer that had very little uh, former employees drawing layoffs. Uh, they would be considered a positive balance employer and would enjoy much better tax rates. The shared work or short time compensation law as written in Kansas uh, requires that a participating employer be a positive balanced employer. Um, We've received a couple different requests from various employers who would like to take advantage of that program and do everything possible to, um, 
maintain employees on the payroll as opposed to doing straight layoffs, which is the, the whole concept behind the shared work program. But unfortunately, due to the nature of their business or their industry, they're in a position currently where they're negative balance employers. So what we'd like to be able to do there is make a, an adjustment. Um, I think uh, the position of the secretary is that anything we can do to keep Kansas workers employed, as opposed to join the, the ranks of those uh, who are laid off, is something we should strongly consider. Okay, thank you. And then we'll move on to Representative Williams. Thank you, Representative Christy Williams. Um, I've got a couple questions for Laurel. And first, a uh, shout out to Julie Mangini, if I'm saying that correctly. She's doing a great job handling a lot of our legislative calls. But regarding that, for question number one, I still have a few individuals that are on those lists that one in particular that's never received a payment and began the process well over a month ago due to technical problems that the websites had. Um, can you give us an update on the, the list of those people that are having trouble either you know, for one reason or the other and um, what that wait time is looking like now for those that can't make the, the process work for them? Yes, thank you very much for that question, Representative. We do have a constituent inquiry team that is uh, working diligently to respond to those requests. When we started, but in, it's primarily made up of some of our retired employees who have returned to work for us. And as we started with um, two individuals doing those, we, we quickly found that, that two people were not enough. And so as the number of, we're not able to keep up with the number of requests. So we've increased staffing um, to that group I have now, I just hired additional people last week. So now we have a total of six people working that list. It is a little difficult. We're trying to get a sense this week of, of where we are and how quickly that they are able to work. Um, it was, we were quoting five days before somebody could get a response, four to five days. We're hoping to decrease that. Um, to a, a much shorter wait time, but I, I believe it's at least still four days as our additional staff that we have brought on are kind of learning the, the ropes of, uh, of responding to a variety of inquiries. Because of, as you've pointed out, Representative, people have a number of issues that may be holding them up, holding up their benefits. And so it's difficult to find people that are specialized in all of those key areas to be able to respond. I feel like I do have a good team built, but it was just put in place and, and the structure built around it um, where I feel like we can make progress as of this week. So we're still at that kind of four day time frame. This actually isn't, thank you very much. This actually isn't my second question, but it's just a quick follow-up to that. Would you say there's a, few, you know, there's a handful of people on the list, hundreds of people on the list? Does it, I, I'm sure it probably grows and changes up and down every day, but what would be yeah. that average number on the list? We get about 150 requests per day. Um, the two staff who had been working the list are able to handle 20 to 40 calls per day, depending on the flexibility or um the, the nature of the call. The other staff members who we have just been able to do about 20 at this point, we expect um, with more time and experience that they will get faster and, and be able to increase those numbers as well. Okay, and then the second question, super quick. Um, you mentioned when you were speaking about a payment cap and that you get to the end of the day and you couldn't make additional payments out so you would do it the next day. Can you explain what that means? Absolutely. So there are a few different payment caps that we have in place at the Department of Labor. One is um, with for able to pay deposit monies. And so we have increased that cap to 150 million per day. Additionally, we have a cap uh, with the Bank of America on the number of dollars that we can pay out through our debit cards. We have increased that to $60 million per day. We are seeing more people choose direct deposit than debit cards, so we expect that to be fine. The real issue that we have at this point in time is, again, with our mainframe system. So the mainframe, uh, when it was built, never contemplated paying out more than $99 million. So we cannot add, or we are working to add a third character to be able to go beyond $99 million per day. Uh, to allow those benefits to be paid out. So that really is the limitation with the mainframe programming only being built for two digits for the uh, million dollar field and not three. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Representative, if, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could add as well, um, Representative Williams, your first question, uh, one thing that is gonna be very helpful that I wanted to note, since PUA did go live uh, today, some of the calls we've already began to see a, a, a slight decrease. Um, and so our, the constituent team that Laura was talking about um, has, has let us know that. So I think we hope to continue as we see that the many days pass by now, people will be able to be uploading their documents to the new Pro, PUA program that went live today. Um, we'll be able to get back to some of your constituents faster. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Representative Williams, do you have anything else? No, thank you. Okay, Representative Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, Representative Kyle Hoffman. Madam Secretary, thank you for, for being here. I just wanna go back to the uh, staffing that you've talked about. Uh, you talked about that you've increased staffing through Department of Commerce, Department of Ag, um, and that you're now uh, looking at, at um, other ways to, to staff and other, I guess you're hiring more people. Um, yeah. I'd kind of like to know what your, your uh, future in game is as far as, I would, would assume that those are all temporary uh, workers, uh, that you're not uh, planning on having them for a long period of time. I think the, one of the best things we can do is quit, um, quit thinking that this is a new normal and start giving hope to people that uh, things are gonna get better on a statewide basis. And uh, uh, I think that as the months go, we'll start seeing those, hopefully those unemployment numbers you know, start going down. So I guess my question is, what's, what is your your look on those on those people that you're hiring, it seems like to me it be be, would have been better for you to go with some some uh, temp agency to or or call center or something to bring uh, people in temporarily instead of uh, hiring people and then maybe uh, hopefully in less than six months you know maybe we'll be able to uh, start uh, um, bringing those numbers down as far as a number of people needed. So what's your what's your anticipated um, uh, goal as far as how many people are you thinking you're going to have and how long and and those sort of things. Thank you, Representative Hoffman, and I'll have my deputy uh, chime in as well. But we are, um, you know, like I said, preparing for the, the summer, as Laurel shared, we have um, hired uh, two teams um, uh, already. And again, and they're smaller teams because of the social distancing, and we have to train them in person. Uh, and we want to be better prepared should we see a, a possible second wave in the fall uh, and to not have to be reactive like we were this time around. Um, and then we're a federally funded, uh, you know, I think the most important piece to understand here is we are a federally funded program and that has been, it's connected to the low unemployment rate. And as we share with you, we, we had like a, a few days notice instead of a few months notice. Uh, and so we were not as prepared in the beginning as I shared with you before. Uh, we uh, staffed up each week, we kept doubling uh, and then I, 20 to 40 to 60, and then we got the triage call center. Now, um, so some of those state employees are having to return to their home. Age. So now we are looking at um, other options of still continuing <coughs> high volume of phone calls. And, and we are considering also, um, you know, attempt uh, calls there, but I'd like to have my um, deputy secretary chime in as well to share with you what our plans moving forward are as well. Can I, can I actually jump in deputy or secretary Garcia? Yes. Um, I would add we are actually using some temporary staffing measures as well. We're using a, a variety of staffing measures. So I have used a temporary agency to hire staff for the PUA program. We know that that's going to be a short-term program, so we have temporary staff. We're also reassigning employees within the Department of Labor temporarily to come and help in some of these different areas. All of the retired employees and former employees that we have brought back, we're bringing back on a temporary basis. They are 999 employees and they are well aware that uh, their employment is just through this, this crisis and to, to get us through. And they've been very responsive and I'm very thankful to have them join us. Many of them volunteered to step up and, and take this, this job on. And then additionally, these classes of employees that we're hiring, they are permanent employees. Um, it's, as I said before, I have a class of five, a class of seven. I'm hiring another class that will hopefully be around 10 for my third class. We always hire intake reps in the summer 
the nature of the job is very difficult. You're talking to people at oftentimes the lowest point in their life, and it can be um, very, very difficult. So we do have turnover in that position. Some of the turnover is good. They promote and move on to other positions within the Department of Labor, which is great. We love to be able to promote from within. Um, and then some of them burn out and, and move on to, to other opportunities. So we are, this is part of kind of the normal cycle. Um, we have started that cycle earlier than we would in other years. Usually we wait until a little bit later in the summer to begin um, the staffing and the intake classes. And we'll just do one to two large classes, but we are in engaging with the temporary staffing agency and we're looking at a variety of different staffing methods. And then if um, Brett would like to add anything else, I would welcome his input at this time. Yeah, one more thing to note in terms of, and I, I, I do appreciate your, your, I think we all need a little bit of that every now and then Representative Hoffman on optimism. So I, I appreciate that because especially in our line of work right now, there's not a, a lot of that in abundance. Um, I think we would all agree though that with the onslaught we face, us and every other state are not able to provide the level of service we would want. Um, even if we do see improvement, which we're all hoping for, and we want to be optimistic about um, most economic predictions are going to show us for a considerable period of time being at levels elevated beyond what we were coming into this recession. So even though we're trying to staff up now to have to handle this massive onslaught, um, going back to Representative Williams, this staff will still be valuable because we're still going to have higher unemployment and hopefully we can get to a level where we're providing much, much better service and not having have people get that difficulty getting in. Um, what we're facing now is unprecedented. There's really no good solution for how to handle it, but we're probably looking at down the road, um, elevated unemployment, hopefully at a lower level. It'll be really good for us to be able to provide the type of service everyone on this call would want for those folks. And that's why the, the extra staffing is still gonna be very valuable to us. Well, I appreciate that. I, I'd i like, I guess, a uh, something later, a memo, if, uh, Mr. Chairman, if it would be okay. I'd kind of like to see a memo of, uh, I mean, you didn't answer really my question as far as, what is your goal as far as how many are you planning to have? What's the, uh, you talk about there's turnover, but then that's fine. But I'd like to see a, uh, a future outlook of what you are, what you're planning to have uh, in the future and uh, the number of people that you've hired and those that are temporary, those that are, are uh, um, you're planning on keeping for a while. That, th those are all issues that are, I assume, you're going to come later wanting more money uh, budgetary wise next year, probably because of, of those issues. And I just like to have a little bit of an idea what, uh, what you're- So on the, on the budget component, um, that's, you know, we went into this with budget challenges because unemployment's federally funded and it's, it's inverse. So when times are really good, your, your budget's really low. Um, right now with the, with the money provided, we talked about needing to, to take the steps to get that those federal dollars, we're getting a substantial amount of federal dollars. So we're gonna be okay from a budget perspective because um, the federal government's pumping quite a bit of money. Um, I think we'll be in a position a little bit farther down the road to try and do some of that analysis. Right now, candidly, as we're still very much in the thick of things, our focus is on getting as many people on the phone, providing as much assistance to people as possible. And then hopefully if we start to see a little bit of a, um, positive momentum in the economy, we can start to do kind of some of that analysis of what, what are some, some numbers we need to like kind of level out at. But as Laurel said, so many of these people are, I mean, um, the, the number of phone calls that came in from former retired employees saying, um, I have a job and I'm still working, but I have four hours on Friday, what can I do to help? Um, the first two folks we talked about doing the constituent work that Laurel referenced uh, were both former call center management people with over uh, 70 plus, plus combined years at the agency, enjoying very nice retirements and they came back and now they're on the phone eight to five every day um, doing everything they can to help people. So some of that will take care of itself. Are there any other questions, Mr. Chair? I think we may have lost the chairman. <laughs> um, I have a question. This is Representative Curtis when, when it's my turn. Uh, members of the committee, it appears that uh, Representative Tarwater got accidentally dropped. I, he should be rejoining shortly. 
I'm back. What did I miss? <laughs> we just passed all these bills. <laughs> <laughs> right. It always happens. Okay. Uh, represent, uh, let's see, where were we? Uh, Representative Hoffman, did you get all your questions answered? Yeah, you can go on. Okay. All right. There was, uh, I wanted to, to touch on some of that stuff. Um, I used to run a call center and I've uh, worked in a few. Um, I would say that, you know, I would suggest that, you know, a five day, I, most recently, I think I heard a 10 day callback list and, and we do want to provide um, the best service we can for these individuals because you, you know, someone mentioned earlier that they are at the lowest point in their life and waiting 10 days or even five days to hear back on a question is, is just too long. And I know you're doing the best you can, and I know you're hiring all the people you can, and it's difficult to hire people for those positions. But these yeah. call centers, they're pretty advanced and pretty technological, and they do have people that are very smart. And you know, you'll have a front line of call of a call bank. They'll be able to get get the initial information and send that an individual to somebody that understands, you know, different different sections of the of the law. You know, they might under they might qualify for your normal unemployment and just have a couple of issues. They type something wrong, uh, or you know, they could be the PEUC or the PUA, uh, and then you the call center would have professionals that understand just those one one or two programs, mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to get through the call list much quicker. Um, yeah. The suggestion, I know you probably already looked at it, but the feds, I believe, did make it available now to be able to use private call centers when, when they used to not. So um, maybe yeah. they are making a suggestion that we look at that. Um, so, you know, just a suggestion. And I think- Yeah, no, we are currently looking at that. Uh, we actually, that's when we just started to use our own uh, state employees. And now that they have to return back, we're looking at that uh, transition plan. Because as you said, are, I know many of your constituents uh, are calling us and we want to be able to answer their calls and get them their money. Um, so whatever we can do to make that happen first, that's we're focusing. We will continue to do that. Okay, before you guys kicked me off the call, I was, uh, I had a uh, representative, I think, Probst, then Curtis, and then now Ruiz. So let's, let's go to Representative Probst. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, uh, I first want to say I have two questions if the chair will allow it, but I also want to thank your staff. Um, Julie's been very responsive to me and I've had a number of uh, issues resolved, so I, I want to say that. Um, so two, two things. Uh, I think that first you guys introduced or brought to us a bill 2704 that would have made some changes for uh, disqualifications to uh, eligibility for unemployment. And I guess I have a question about um, whether we need to look at that also. I, I wonder if there are any adjustments. The example that was raised to me was that I think one of the changes would have been if, uh, if you had been overpaid at some point, um, you were disqualified for a five-year period, but then if you paid that back and you weren't in arrears on that anymore, should you then still be locked out of the unemployment system for five years? Um, is that something that we should be looking at as well right now? Uh, we, we have heard a number of um, concerns on that, uh, especially from uh, many of you. Um, and this is something uh, I would probably want my deputy secretary to chime in because we did, this was done uh, prior to my time. Um, and we wanted, and now that we're hearing all these uh, phone calls, this is something, again, that could change uh, with the federal um, legislation that may be coming. But Brett, will you uh, share some information on that back? And you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, that marks the 5,000th time I forgot to unmute during the course of this pandemic. Um, so historically in Kansas, the fraud denial was one year. That's pretty common for what most states are. Usually it's about one year to two years. Um, in 2013, House Bill 2105, um, that penalty was extended to five years. Um, so the claimant uh, gets a 25% penalty, which was a federal law requirement partially, interest, and also a five-year denial. Um, our legislative team can send specific information. We did propose a bill this year as part of our legislative package, um, and obviously, you know, the legislature was somewhat reduced this year, 
that would um, remove that five-year penalty for any claimant that had successfully paid back the benefits as well as the penalty and the interest. Um, so what we're finding now is we do have a, um, a group of claimants out there who maybe had a fraud finding and it was $400 or $200 or $600. And they diligently worked to pay that money off, get it paid back and paid everything they're supposed to. And now they're denied for another year, another two years, another three years. And in this so few jobs available, they don't really have any benefit of, of the social safety net. Um, there is a chance, and, I, and Laurel may want to weigh in, that those individuals could perhaps take advantage of the pandemic unemployment assistance program, but we've had a little bit of a difficulty getting clear guidance from USDOL as to whether or not that would be uh, allowable under federal law. Um, they seem to be hinting that they'd be okay with it, but they haven't come out and said that they would be okay with. Is that a fair statement, Laurel? Yes, that's accurate. We're trying to get more clear guidance from USDOL on that very point. Um, at this point, that is part of phase three. Um, so phase one has been accepting the applications. Two is, is payment of benefits to, to those folks who are clearly eligible for those benefits. And then phase three is the more difficult cases where we have to um, we're still waiting on some further guidance from USDOL on this particular situation. So um, as Brett said, I've, I've, seen, I've seen them leaning both ways and um, I would hate to pay out benefits and then be told that we need to recoup those. And so we're trying to um, get more, more clear guidance. Okay. Before we know. Certainly that legislation um, is something that, that could be considered. We also had a provision in there eliminating the offset for pensions, um, which is also impacting a group of claimants. And Representative, I'd also like to add, uh, thank you, Earl, um, that should there be, and as, as we've alluded to, we keep hearing uh, updates on a weekly basis um, from USDOL. Again, the reason why it'd be important to um, be able to be flexible this summer and fall is if something were to happen like that to enable that we want to make sure that your constituents are covered. Um, so again, I just want to reiterate the importance of um, extending the emergency um, for us for the state of Kansas. The, Madam Secretary, that goes right into my next question is I'm, I'm to, at the issue in front of us, um, we, we need to do something. So what are, I guess I want to get a sense of what we what our options are to ensure that you have the, the measures that we can take or the methods through which we ensure you have that flexibility and uh and what it looks like if you don't have that flexibility uh okay um so one we would just there because there's so many moving parts at so many moving times i would not be able to honestly answer uh what that is specifically what i can say is the important thing is, is to allow us the flexibility. So uh, to continue the current um, emergency um, uh, state that we have right now uh, with the, what the governor has uh, to continue that. Um, because if, if that sunsets at the end of this month and we need, um, as, as Laurel shared, more into September and should there be a second wave of this, we actually would need till December. So really just to be able to allow the governor to um, extend that um, is the most important piece. And, and we shared that conversation with the chair, Mr. Chair yesterday um, and other legislators. So that, that would be a, a big part. Um, you said another question and Brett, uh, chime in too, if I missed something else. What was the other part of your question, Representative? It, it was more about what, well, it was more about what would happen if, ah. if we didn't have that flexibility, but you kind of raised an issue I want to touch on. Um, I can just remember what I was going to say. Oh, go ahead. The main thing would happen is we would not be able to uh, receive any funds. Let me repeat that. We will not be able to receive any federal funds, which would be catastrophic uh, for your constituents to not receive any unemployment funds beyond May 31st. Um, and like I said, we keep hearing updates and a constant communication with the federal government, USDOL, um, on a weekly, if not sometimes daily basis. And should something change in the summer or another bill comes in, in July or August, uh, we will need to have that flexibility to enact some of those uh, measures. 
Go ahead, Representative. Thank you. Well, th no, thank you. So I'll I'll say I'll ask this, and then I'll wrap I'll wrap this up. So the preferred, the easiest route to give you what you need and to secure federal funds is to extend the, is it Executive Order 2017, uh, to to extend the emergency order. If that doesn't happen, or if that is somehow challenged, then then we need to have this legislation as a backstop. Yes, well, essentially that would be up to you all to, to determine what that'd be, but I think the easiest, if, if you're not gonna have any committee hear, hearings is to um, you know, keep the emergency declaration in place. That's the goal here, to keep the emergency declaration in place, uh, at least through the, the rest of the year, because we don't know what's coming through the pipes um, in the summer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Uh, committee members, the, the chair uh, got dropped again. Um, I believe he is back. No, oh, I'm back. Uh, that drop was my fault. So I guess it's a fall down, not a drop. Uh, I forgot <laughs> to plug my computer in and it ran out of battery. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did, did you have a question for me? Uh, no, I just finished. Um, Representative Probe's uh, question about what would need to happen, um, and I answered the, of the keeping the emergency declaration in place uh, through the rest of the year. What okay. we did with you yesterday, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, okay, great. Um, Representative Curtis, you had some questions. I actually, Jason um, asked the same question I was gonna ask, so I'm good. Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, John Hess, who was out oh, Rui, Ruiz, Representative Ruiz. Uh, you need to unmute. Okay, now, yeah. uh, two, two questions and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, the $600 coming more from the feds that we're looking at the tax liability on that, I know Representative Corbett had discussed uh, that with the employers earlier on what their liabilities are. Would there be a more touring thing for the feds on both ends for the uh, claimants and also the payee? I don't understand your question. Are, 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 are claimants going to be dinged harder on these next $600 as they would ordinarily? Uh, on the regular benefits, or would they be able to get a moratorium from the federal government uh, based on the current circumstances? I'm Laurel. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and jump in here. We have not heard of any moratorium on the income tax requirements for the $600 at this point. Um, as Jerry Garcia indicated, there could be um, further uh, laws passed later this summer, but it, at this point, there's been no moratorium on income tax requirements for the additional 600 or the regular unemployment insurance benefit payments. Thank you, Laura. And then my last question, Madam Secretary, can you elaborate? I don't know if this uh, follows source, but with our uh, southwestern, southwestern Kansas, our meatpacking facilities there, uh, the unemployment status and what's going on there, can you elaborate on what's happening with our people there? Um, Representative Reese. So I don't have, um, I, I can share with you the employment numbers uh, per se in Southwest Kansas. Um, and just so you know, we have a, a weekly review of on unemployment numbers every Tuesday. So the fresh numbers just came out a couple hours ago. And looking at the numbers here, um, usually we consider Ford, Finney, uh, County, and uh, Ford County is at about 300 and uh, 20 and 518. Oh, those are the um, unemployment insurance. Yeah, they're actually there. So it's in, considered in the higher range. The, the highest numbers of counties that we have are Cedric County and Johnson County and Wyandotte County. Um, and then next under that level would be uh, counties like Ford and Finney. Finney being the highest, which is Garden City area. Um, I can't really uh, speak to whether these numbers are coming from meatpacking plants. Um, that would be more so with Department of, of Ag, but we are seeing uh, the high numbers. Uh, and of course, um, with the COVID-19 case numbers as well, uh, increased in the, those counties. 
but as far as unemployment numbers, we don't know where specifically um, the employers or places of, of work are. We just know the numbers in the county. Thank you. Representative Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is Representative Williams. And so I had a question about the comment regarding the emergency um, act or order must be in place from the governor. It sounds to me that if we put these items into statute, uh, and if there were a change in something that were to come down the pipeline from the feds that we don't, we didn't anticipate, we could have a special assess session to address it. But it sounds that uh, to me by your six items that you're requesting, if we put those um, in statute, then that would take care of any issues with the federal government. Um, because we know right now, for example, FEMA is not requiring the state of Kansas or any state to have their own declaration or emergency declaration. They're still providing um, without that. And so I'm assuming that uh, the unemployment insurance might be the same, but I have not yet confirmed that with our congressman. So I, I didn't know if you could elaborate on whether or not the statute, you know, by fixing this on the 21st would resolve our issues except for the unknowns that might be out there. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Representative. Um, whatever the mechanism is, whether it be statute, whether it be um, keeping the emergency declaration in place, whatever that may be, uh, we just wanted to be able to have access to receive the funds so that um, your constituents could have access and receive unemployment benefits. Um, so it, it'll be up to you, you all to decide what that mechanism is. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that, that extending the, the uh, emergency order is not the only method. Thank you. Okay, I don't, I don't, I'm seeing no no further questions from the committee. I have a few, um, and so if you guys end up having a question, I know we're running kind of late on, uh, on time. Um, I wanted to address the, the extended 13 weeks, the PEUC program. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the few programs that have come out that I don't really have a good grasp on. So can you kind of walk us through how that works? I mean, I know, and, and whether or not it'll affect the unemployment rate, uh, in, insurance rate for businesses, since that's not current state law and that's an executive order type thing. Yes, Laurel, I have Laurel. Okay. Um, so the, thank you, Mr. Chairman, the PUC um, benefits are paid by the federal government. And so there would be no tax liability for the employers. It provides an additional 13 weeks of benefits to those who have exhausted regular UI. So in Kansas, um, if you've ex exhausted your 26 weeks, if you filed your claim after January 1st, 2020, or if you exhausted 16 uh, and filed your claim prior to January 1st, 2020, then you can apply for PEUC uh, once that program is up and running and receive those benefits. That benefit amount is paid at the, it's the same amount that you received under regular UI. So if your weekly benefit amount was $320, then you would uh, receive $320, but it would be federally funded for those 13 weeks. Um, those benefits would continue until you could, up to 13 weeks, or if you triggered onto a new benefit year and you could establish a new benefit year before the exhaustion of those 13 weeks, then you can return to regular unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, and then you would have the remaining weeks if then you exhausted again, which hopefully no one is in that position, um, but you could collect the remainder of those 13 weeks and then you could potentially receive benefits from the PUA program. So the federal legislation has really been um, provided a lot of a lot of benefits to unemployed uh, to unemployed workers. <laughs> it makes it hard to want to go back to work if you could do that all that back to back to back. All right. Um, so would that also include the extra $600 or just what the state was paying? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, it does include the additional $600. So the $600 is paid on top of your unemployment insurance benefit, a PUC benefit or a PUA benefit, but it only run, at this point, it only runs until the end of July. 
So okay. after the, the end of July, then the additional $600 per week should no longer be available unless it is extended by Congress. Okay, uh, thank you. And you had said when it becomes available in Kansas, are we, it was my understanding that if you, that the PAU program, if you entered all your information into that, or that's where you would go to enter the information for the ex extended 13 weeks. And at the end of that, they would shift you over. Is that, are we, are we not able to accept applicants yet on the extension? Cause it was my, yeah, we're, it would all go through the same thing. No, it, it, so the systems are connected. So before you could receive uh, PUA or PUUC, you would have to file a regular unemployment insurance claim. Um, so that is the first step for receiving PUA is to be ineligible for regular unemployment insurance. PEUC would actually, so if I'm a, a claimant receiving unemployment insurance benefits and I exhaust my benefits, I would actually go on PEUC first before I could trigger on to PUA. So um, you can, to make it even more complicated, you can bounce back and forth between the systems like, like I explained uh, before, where you can exhaust, jump back to regular UI, then go on the extension again, then go on to PUA. Um, PUA is available until the end of December, 2020. Um, PEUC was, uh, is our last program that we are attempting to, to stand up. They are working on it right now to get that in place. Um, the thought being that, that this crisis started um, March of, of this year, um, that, that those people would have some time on regular unemployment before they exhausted and would need the additional 13 weeks. But certainly we know that there are people who started their claim um, you know, may have been separated, not related to COVID, now can't get a job because of COVID um, that, that are in need of those benefits. And so we're trying to get that stood up as quickly as possible. It's similar to during the Great Recession, there was a program called EUC, um, Emergency Unemployment Compensation. It's similar to tier one of EUC. Okay, so the PEUC will be available in when? So uh, it's supposed to be, we're supposed to be later this month. Okay. Um, Representative Corbett. You still have a question, Representative Corbett? You're on mute. So can you hear me now? Yep. So the question I have is, as things start to open up in Kansas and the employers want to call their employees back, and if the employees say, nope, I'm making more on unemployment, uh, if they're offered a job, do they, do they, does the employee have the option to come back to work or stay on unemployment? So we have issued uh, last week um, the job refusal policy, and I'll let Laurel um, add on to this, but there, uh, the individual has to, must come back. Um, there is paperwork where the individual and the employer um, have to communicate with us, um, but Laurel, if you can speak more to the job refusal piece. Yes, so as I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, one of the reasons that you can be disqualified for unemployment insurance is if you refuse an offer of suitable work without good cause. Um, that's Ooh. under current state law and it remains under current state law. So if you've been called back to work, uh, you are required to go back to work unless you have good cause for not going. So we are going to look at a, a multitude of factors in making that determination, whether the work is suitable and whether there is good cause for refusing that work. If you are asking somebody to, to return to their normal job um, at their a prior rate of pay, um, they were working at it before, they have the training skills and experience to do that job, certainly would be considered uh, suitable work, but then we have to look in light of COVID at different health factors. Are the employer, am I someone who's high risk or um, am I not? Is the employer taking appropriate health and safety measures, allowing for social distancing and protective gear um, appropriate for the workplace? Um, and then uh, we do ask employers who, uh, you know, Representative, as you said, if it's just, I'm making more on unemployment than I am working and don't wanna work, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we would ask that the employers report that job refusal to us. 
<coughs> and, and while she clears her throat, uh, there is a form that is available on our website that the employer is able to um, use. And then we will be, uh, they would be working with us and we would uh, do the investigation on that. But that form is available um, as well as workplace safety uh, guidance on the um, covid.ks.gov uh, website as well. So that way, um, you know, just to make sure everybody's uh, working safely, but also to for the employer to have the opportunity to fill out that form that is available on our website. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, any further questions, Representative Corbett? All right, I, uh, I have a couple of questions on Executive Order 17. The first thing it did was waive the waiting week. Um, and that is one of the things that you're requesting to do in the bill in order to keep, uh, keep receiving federal funds and have them pay that first week. Um, it is my understanding that we accomplished that in the bill that we passed right before we left. Uh, so is there, did we not word that correctly or does it need to be, how does it need to be worded if we did? And so I'm gonna have my deputy um, legal counsel answer that if she can unmute you now. Okay. Yes, thank you, Secretary. And I'm sure Laurel could speak more to this. Okay. But um, in reviewing the uh, the legislation that you your body had passed, um, it really is kind of narrowly tailored towards the um, the issues before and not truly the the federal. If I remember right, um, I believe that that waiting week was allowed to be waived after. Um, completion of three weeks of unemployment consecutive to such waiting period. And um, in this situation, in response to the federal act, it's just immediate. Charles or Chuck, can you, can you opine as to how, what we changed? Because it was my understanding that we removed the waiting week and had that sunset sometime next year. Chairman, this is Charles Reimer, assistant revisor of statutes. Um, I'm gonna turn my video here. Um, Ms. Peters Somebody is correct. Ms. Peters is correct um, in that um, the way the the statute, or the, rather the way the bill was worded, um, was that the uh, compensation was paid after uh, a three week period. So I uh, am not familiar with whether or not that meets the requirements of federal law, but she is correct. Uh, to, to how the language was worded in the bill. Okay, thank okay. you. If I could add, Mr. Chair, that, that legislation had already started progressing originally as a response to the aerospace situation. Sure. Not to this crisis. So I think it was kind of already in the pipeline and had some good bipartisan support. So I think that was kind of the quickest way to get it done in terms of just doing that. Uh, that's how it had previously been in Kansas, where if you had three previous weeks, three three weeks of unemployment, you got the waiting week. So I think that's just kind of the route we went as a state. This would be sure we're in full compliance with the federal government, where the intent seems to be. And again, same with what Charles said, I don't I, I don't have a definitive ruling on that, but their clear intent was to get money out the door immediately. Okay, thank you for that. And then uh, so. Duly noted, we can make that change if we need to. Uh, and then the second part of that was that we were requ required to, to, to waive the fact that they needed to look for, for new employment. And when I discussed that, uh, so the way the, the way the executive order was worded was anyone that's on unemployment is no longer required to look for work, although we do have them log on every week to just in case they did find work, but they're not required to do so. And when I talked to the US Department of Labor about that clause, um, I believe that their requirement, and he, he sent me, um, I don't know, a thousand pages worth of stuff. I haven't gotten through it all, but I will before Thursday when, he, when, he, when he's on. But it's my understanding that that requirement was for the businesses that we closed as a government and said they could not operate. So they would not, like business owners and people that work for non-essential businesses that were going to be expecting their exact same job back when we allowed those businesses to open, weren't required to look for other employment. But I don't think that it was meant for anyone and everyone on unemployment that doesn't that 
didn't have a job before this or doesn't have a job and won't have the same job coming back. Um, it wasn't meant just to waive that requirement because there are a lot of other jobs out there and there are online interviews and online everything. So uh, people working from home, Amazon needing to hire people, Walmart needing to hire people. And so there are jobs out there and, it, and um, if the intent was only to protect the people that own the businesses or work for uh, non-essential businesses, then we probably wanna look at that to make sure that we can get the employees back to work quicker. Um, is that how you understand that or Am I completely missing it? Madam Secretary? I may have my UI director address that. Okay. Uh, thank you. That is not how I understood it. I can let um, Eunice speak to it more as she's done more research on the federal legislation. But I certainly um, sympathize with those business owners as I'm trying to hire people right now and, and finding it difficult to do. So I would like to take a, a further look at that. Um, Eunice, can you offer any insight? So the um, guidance we've gotten from USUL has not been that clear, but I will tell you the way they have drafted it in their guidance and in the text is um, a waiver of work search, a waiver of the waiting week, and then um, the non-charging allowances for employers directly impacted by COVID. And then it goes on to say, due to an illness in the workplace or direction from a public health official to isolate or quarantine workers. Now that is a, a, a good question because I have wondered if that last section that talks to due to applies to all three elements or just the last one. And the guidance that they've given us makes it look like it just applies to the last element. But what we have done is since yesterday, we further looked at that and we did at least try to, we did further revise that provision and sent that to um, Mr. Reimer to um, add to the bill, but to at least um, narrow down that, that waiver, the work search requirement to this pending crisis. But that is something certainly I've been watching for, and we can certainly look and reach out to USDOL as well to show if that element is should be narrowly construed to that um, specific situation you're talking about. Okay, thanks for that. I appreciate that. And if you hear anything back, if you could, uh, you know, get that to me or Dana so that we can circulate that to the committee to look at. Um, but uh, Kevin Curlew will be on with us um, Thursday, hopefully, he's still waiting to hear back from the federal government on whether or not they'll allow him to come come on and testify. But um, he is, I believe, he's listening in in today, and hopefully, if not, he'll he could he can listen to it later on YouTube. But um, he's he's supposedly monitoring our conversation today and taking notes, and hopefully, he'll have an answer for for us one way or another whether or not he will testify, um, you know, on Zoom or if he'll just let us know. So we'll, we'll move on from that. Um, I had another question regarding the shared work program. I know we're running late and I'm sorry, but I just wanna make sure we've got this right. The shared work program, um, if an individual just gets their hours cut because there's not enough business, does that, can they start to unemployment or does the employer have to participate in a shared work program or how, how does that work? How do we get, get help to that individual? Uh, Laurel, you want to speak to the shared work? It depends. Uh, thank you. It depends on the number of hours that the employees or the number of hours that are reduced for that employee's work week. Um, and so to qualify for the shared work program, the group of uh, impacted workers, there has to be a reduction in 20 to 40 percent of their hours. Um, somebody can have their hours of work reduced and still qualify for unemployment insurance benefits, there's going to be an offset um, depending on their earnings. And so that's made on a case-by-case -case basis as to what, what that offset is. Um, but you do not have to participate in the shared work program to uh, receive a partial unemployment insurance benefit if you're cut from, you know, uh, 40 hours to, to 20 hours or whatever the case may be. Okay, so if an individual... Um would they just go onto the normal benefit site and would they be denied since they're still working or and then have to take another step or how, how does that work? No, so they would just have to go apply at the normal benefits site, um, submit an initial claim, and then on their weekly claims filings, they would have to report 
the numbers of hours work and their their earnings for that week. Okay, great. Thanks for the clarification. Um, all right, some of you are on uh, tax committee and I believe that's gonna have to start here in a few minutes. Uh, so with that, um, I will uh, close the meeting and thank everyone for their time. Thank you committee members for making this and thanks for the great questions. Madam Secretary, keep up thank the you. great work and your staff is wonderful and uh, we really appreciate, I, I deal with Julie all the time too. And yes, saw, we all love Julie. <laughs> so it, it seems like, uh, you know, she's everyone's go-to person. You need to get her some help. <laughs> yes, no, we, we have an amazing team here. I'm very proud of the work we're doing. We're doing everything we can and we'll continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair and all committee members. You bet. All right, guys, thanks a lot. With that, we're done. Thank you. We adjourn. <laughs>